Here's 30 minutes of music production advice to help take your songs to the next level. The aim of this video is for you to learn as much as you can, and hopefully within the next 30 minutes you pick up on a ton of tips that will ultimately make you a better music producer. Anyways though, we're not going to waste any time, we are going to go ahead and jump straight into this here, so let's begin. So the first thing I'm going to be talking about is how I usually go about starting stuff with chords. This is super important and I have a nice easy way where I've figured this out. My number one recommendation would be to use a MIDI keyboard and we'll get more into that later. But for the very beginning here, we're just going to be looking straight at the piano roll. So I've put together a low passed saw patch and I'm going to show you how I usually write chords. The first thing I do is try to figure out a bass line. It doesn't matter how simple it is. I'll just put the bass notes down. I usually just do this by feel. So we start on this note. I'm just picking randomly here. So I've done this now. One, two, three, four. So I mainly just go by ear. If I pick the wrong note and I know it's out of key, I'll go and correct it. That's just something you sort of pick up over time. But here's how we would turn this into its own chord progression. So usually I copy and paste and I duplicate an octave up, just so that way we have like a bass layer. Then I copy and paste again, and we're actually gonna do some counting here. We're gonna go up one, two, three, four, copy and paste again, five, six, seven. So what this has done is it's made major chords. They're not all gonna be right though, because obviously some of them are gonna want to be minor, but let me demonstrate. So what's interesting actually, I've just discovered this as I've gone through, I think it actually sounds good either way. There are chords where like it will very obviously sound wrong if you have like a major chord where a minor should be or vice versa, but in this instance specifically you can kind of get away with it. And that's nice, so it's going to depend on what like the rest of your track is like. But that's how I make chords fast and easy. Obviously these are super simple chords, and there's a lot you could do to make them more interesting. Some of those tips being like chord voicings for example. We just go and maybe move the notes to all be closer together so it's more like realistic as to how you'd play it on a piano. You see? Now we have an interesting progression. It's also fun to sometimes see if you could find like a root note that you could hold all the way through. See that works. You can hold that A sharp the entire time. You could probably also do this one. You totally can. You could absolutely get away with that. So that's a nice way to take a simple chord progression and make it a lot more advanced. Very, very useful trick. I think for this video, I'll try to actually apply like a whole bunch of these tips and maybe make something from scratch all on this project. Not too sure about that. This is very unscripted, just kind of freeform. But you see here how I've set up this patch. This is a nice saw patch. I'm going to show you how to give one some movement as well. This should help you out if you're starting off. Obviously, if you're following along, you've got a chord progression and you want like that synth patch to kind of take over, have a vibe going, and I'll show you how I usually do that. So first off, I drag an LFO over to the cutoff knob on a low pass filter. And from here, we're gonna set this to eighths rhythm and just make a shape like this. This will give you this kind of sound. And then obviously we change the knob to wherever we want it to be. That's a pretty cool tone right now. I'm really liking where that's sitting. But there's some things we could do to that to make it even better. Go to the effects tab, and the first thing I like to do on a sound like this is put it in a space. You could do that with reverb. What I like to do though, is not do a super long decay reverb, instead one that's super short and lower the size a lot too, and then just crank the mix knob a bit. You could hear exactly what that's done. If we put it up to 100, that's what it sounds like fully wet. I like it right around 50. I think that sounds really cool. It also helps to throw delay on a sound like this, because it'll give you some additional stereo information, which is quite nice. Just makes it a little wider. And chorus is also really nice for that kind of tone, too. But you remember how, like, literally just like a minute or two ago, this was just a simple saw patch, and now we have a really cool bass to make the rest of the song with. Another thing I want to mention, and this is super important, this is talking about the key of your tracks. Sub basses in particular. So obviously we don't really have anything going on here. We're going to make a new patch and I will make it just a default solve for right now, just to demo this. We could select our bass notes from before, because those are very obvious. 
they're actually going to sit down an octave though. So my point that I want to mention is that the key of your track does matter, because subwoofers, like in clubs and stuff, can only output so low before they tend to bottom out. I could already tell you, just based from experience, this C sharp right here is going to be a problem note on a big system. Oftentimes you'll find the lowest you could comfortably hit is this note, like an E, or one below it, maybe like D sharp. Anything below that, I tend to avoid. Sometimes I'll go for the low D, but it's best to just kind of have everything sitting in a region that's comfortable. I've also found you don't really want to go too much above, like, say, a high B like this. So sometimes, like, the C up here, these will often sound a little too high for sub bass. So I like to try to make my tracks exist between those two barriers. So I'm going to go up a few. I could reasonably do that. I went up three. Our highest note is the B, and our lowest is an E. But you want to remember, if you're ever changing the key of your track to accommodate this, you want to change everything, otherwise it's not going to be in key anymore. Now these should play nicely together, and it will exist in a region that's like really comfortable for a subwoofer to go and play. Obviously that patch is harsh, it sounds very simple and boring, but take a listen now. That means every single chord change is going to hit on a note that's still bassy, and that's good. That's something you absolutely want. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is how to fill out the space in a track once you have these two elements being basically a chord patch and your bass. So again, right now it sounds like this. And you know, this exists solely in like the lows and the mids. There's not really anything in the highs. But there's a cool little trick I like to use with strings to do this fast and easy. So FL Studio actually has some cool strings built right in on the instruments folder under orchestral. And what we're actually going to do is go into Piano Roll. Do you remember those two notes that we were able to hold all the way through the chords? So that being this F sharp and that C sharp. We're just going to fill those onto some strings like this and just have them going the entire time. That sounds pretty nice. We could mess with octaves. This might actually sound good an octave up. Actually, I'm thinking it's going to sound good in both areas. So we're going to do like this, something like that, just make a bit of a stack. I like to throw that on its own mixer so I could do some EQing, get rid of the very highs, like so, and maybe a bit of those low and mids, like that. Turn it down a bit, you don't want this too loud, and I also like throwing a chorus on there just to widen things up a bit. It's a small detail, but it makes a lot of difference in making your mix slightly more full. Going further on that, we're going to do another trick to make things more full. Same thing, we're going to take a look on the same pattern as the chords, and we're going to draw in a bit of an arp. So first off, I'm just going to use a default saw and lower the decay and sustain a bit, so that way we can begin writing an arp. And with this, I like to look at the piano roll in that same pattern so I can see my chords, so it's easier to pick notes that are correctly in key. So obviously we don't want a note that long. We're gonna do very short. Something like that maybe. And then just make it change as the chords change. See here, I'm only really changing one note, but it sounds like this now. Obviously we don't wanna keep the sound like that. We are gonna change it to make it more interesting. But for now, while we're writing the melody, it'll do. Right, something like that. It's not perfect, but it'll do for what I'm trying to demonstrate here. We're going to put that on its own mixer channel, and we're just going to mess with choosing different wavetables until we have something that sounds a bit more pleasing. That's actually quite a nice one, not one I usually go for. So we want to make this more interesting with some delay, same as the chords from before. Throw in some chorus too, same reverb trick I taught you before. Maybe a bit more decay though. You see, now this is in a space and it fills out an area that's kind of lacking with the chords. So that means now when we put everything together, this should be a nice big stack that sounds good. It is. So this is basically, I treat this as like this is the bedding of the track. And from here, we're going to go ahead and be able to introduce a lead melody. And I'm going to go over some tips about that because soon we'll have like kind of the equivalent of where we'd want to add in drums, maybe like a drop or something. And to do that, it's best to start kind of here because you can build it out slowly over time. 
So I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. We're actually going to hover over the pattern that has our chords again for the same trick because we want to see the note data while we're writing a lead. Now, lead melodies and writing them is kind of a skill that you develop over time. Obviously, you have to be taught like to know like what's in key or not, but in terms of vibe, I don't really know if it's something that can be taught. It's just something you pick up. I do have some tips though. Right now I'm in piano roll and you see like I could see these to know like what's in key. I don't know, like that. But the point is that I want to bring out, you could be using a keyboard. If you're someone whose instrument is like a piano, that's something you're good at. I know for me, like I've been playing piano for the majority of my life, so that's definitely my instrument. You want to hook up a MIDI keyboard so you could actually play here instead. It's a lot easier than piano roll because you have like the feel, it's just more natural. And obviously this kind of applies if that's like an instrument you're good with. But I highly recommend it. I think it's a lot easier. You can get MIDI keyboards for cheap. If you don't have one, you can go ahead and draw them in here. That's really all this is. You just have to click, so it's a little harder to be expressive. And we'll touch more on that soon. But we're going to try to come up with a melody here. This melody is kind of weird. Not usually the direction I would take him. But we'll put that on its own mixer. And then talk a little bit about lead sound design. Now, I keep my leads very, very simple. It's not something I go crazy with. I usually just mess with like a saw or a square, put it in a space with reverb, but I'll kind of demo how I begin this here. I have some sliding going on now. I like to add the vibrato, then reduce it. Maybe have another saw that's an octave up or so. Mess with FM between the two. That's given us a cool tone already, which is exciting. And then I throw on the reverb. It's actually a very important part because without it, it sounds kind of basic, but with it, suddenly it's big. Same exact tricks as everything else. It always applies. Get delay going to beef it up a bit and some chorus. With this one as well, you might want to try messing with a multiband compressor. Should bring things out and glue it together nicely. It does. Now, in a sound like this, the high end is out of control. I would argue this is one of the most important tips I can give you, and it's so simple. EQ out unnecessary highs. That's it. Genuinely, you might think you need it to be bright, and to a degree, yeah, you do, but you could cut out a lot before it starts to dull the sound. And it's just unnecessary. Like, see, this sounds fine to me. If we turn it off, just here, it's like a blast of white noise. You don't need it. Obviously, cut unnecessary lows, too. There's a lot in this kind of sound. That's a simple trick, and it'll just make it compete less with other elements in your track, and it will just sound nice. The next thing I want to talk about is sidechain. So I do have these sidechain triggers at the top that I actually have set up as a template on FL, so they auto-apply to everything. But I'll show you exactly what those are, in case you don't know, so you can set this up for yourself. All that is, is a kick sample for the top one, and a snare for the bottom one, shortened to as little as they could be, and then they're going to actually go in the same positions as your kick and snare. They're both on their own master channel, so being one and two, and they are unlinked from the master. That's pressing this button down here. That means that they do not make sound. Like you see, they're playing, but you cannot hear them. They're just triggers. It's basically saying there's something here and I want sidechain to trigger when this plays. But obviously that's not set up yet. I'm gonna show you how to do that. So first off, just for the sake of it, you're gonna to wanna to grab a kick and a snare. I'll pick any random ones here, it does not matter. So there's a kick. And the reason sidechain is necessary, in case you're unfamiliar with it, is because, for example, our bass, that's our bass, this is our kick. They exist in the same area, they're both bass. And you don't really want two bass elements playing on top of each other. You get distortion, it's not good. And I'll demo that exactly now. So let me open up what's called an oscilloscope. This will give us a nice visual of our track. This, that's our kick, right? Let's play it over top our bass. So make it where you can see both. See how it looks all deformed now? That's distortion. What you actually wanna do is duck the bass so that way when that kick is here, there's no bass and then it just kind of fades in cleanly. If you do sidechain right, you won't even hear it. It's just a matter of cleaning things up on a technical level. There are instances where you will hear it, and that's also intentional, like a lot of house tracks do very intentional, like longer sidechain. 
But in this, it's just gonna be tight. So we've got our kick. We're gonna grab a snare as well. Perfect, whatever. Doesn't matter if it's gonna fit the track or not. It's just a demo side chain. Yeah, these are not the right drums for the track, but just to demo this on a technical level. So what I like to do to save CPU, I make a new mixer channel called Sidechain, and anything that is going to be sidechained, I'll root to here. This will not have any additional effects on it, apart from the plugin we use for Sidechain. So we're gonna tie this to it. This is gonna go to it too. So is that one. So is that. And so is our lead. Perfect. So there are multiple ways to do this. I have a free way to show you, and I have a paid way. I do think the paid way is, of course, better, not just because I paid for something, but it does have a very nice use. But I'll go ahead and demo both of them. So right now we're going to start with the kick. We are going to right-click on the little arrow at the bottom of that sidechain channel, and a menu will come up that doesn't show on the video, but it's just a couple of options. You want to choose sidechain to this track. And then from here, you want to open up whatever you're going to use to sidechain. There's a lot of different ways. If you're NFL, you could use Fruity Limiter for free. Go to the Compression tab. There's this button for sidechain, and you want to choose your kick sidechain trigger. It will be named there if you've labeled it. And here, you can begin to set up your sidechain. So you want to drag the threshold all the way down, and then I like to up knee and ratio a little bit. And you can hear it now. If we over-exaggerate it, see how everything's ducking now. There it is without the drums too. So you want it to be tight for a drum and bass track like this. So that's just lowering the release until you get it where it needs to be. But remember I said I have a paid way that I think is a little bit better. I'm gonna explain the benefits of that now. We're gonna get rid of Fruity Limiter. And I do this with FabFilter Pro MB. This is a multi-band compressor. So you go into the little gear symbol, processing. There's a sidechain option. Same exact thing as the other way. You choose that kick sidechain trigger. And the benefit here is that you can multi-band sidechain. So you might want to sidechain your lows differently than your mids and highs. You see here I've made a band, it's everything below 150. You open up this expert menu, hit this free button and this external button, and now it is in sidechain mode. You want to drag the attack all the way to zero, so that way it's happening instantly. And to demonstrate, I'll just drag the range and the threshold all the way down. And then you want to solo it so you can hear it. So this release knob is the exact same as what we were doing in Fruity Limiter, but now only for the lows. You set up another one with the same settings, but for like your mids and highs, for example. And now you can control these with different values. So if you want your bass to be tighter and this one to be a little longer, you can do that. And you'll often find that's the case. That's usually what you're going to want. So that is a very simple way to get that set up, a free way and a paid way. Now, the next few things of production tips in this video are going to be about pianos. Now, this is going to be going over like different piano sounds, like also using a MIDI keyboard, things like that. Overall, this is going to be pretty useful to you, especially if you have FL, because the first thing I want to show you is a really nice free piano that's built right into FL Studio. If you go to this packs folder on the left and then go to instruments and then keyboard, here you have a couple of different piano sounds that are just built right in. Two of them in particular I think are really good, being the first one close grand and the last one stage grand. We're going to go ahead and demo those here. So you just drag it in like that, that's how simple it is. And now we've got this open and we could use it however we want. I'm going to throw it on a random mixer channel so I can add effects to it later when we talk about how to process pianos. But right now I've just plugged in my MIDI keyboard. We're going to play a bit on both of these so you could hear what they sound like. So this is the first one, Close Grand. Very nice tone, I quite like that one, it's super good. And again, there's a second one that's a lot different that I also think is really nice. This one being the Stage Grand. This one sounds like this. Super nice piano tones all around. Again, those are built right into FL Studio, so you can access them for free if you have this software. But now we're gonna get into a little bit more about piano processing. 
There is a really cool technique I do often that I think gives you a super unique tone, and this is really easy to do. All you do is you hit this little gear symbol, and you're going to get access to this pitch knob. I set this to 12, so it's a full octave, and then I pitch it down 12. Now, when you play this keyboard, this is not the same as just playing an octave below, because this actually re-pitches every single sample that's used. And depending on what values you use for this range button here, you can actually get completely different tones. So for example, now this should sound a lot darker and softer, and it sounds really different. Listen to that. To give you a super clear demonstration, if we do it up 12, you're going to get this instead. So like slowly you start to lose like the normal piano sound and it just becomes different. I don't like pitching it up really, but pitching it down is a very cool tone. I've actually got a piano I tend to use. This one's not free, but this is a contact library. And I'll show you how to do the same thing if you have a contact piano. So this one, there is the tune knob right here. And it's the same thing. You would just drag this down 12. So you've got the same kind of thing there. But we're going to put this back to zero, and I'm going to talk about things I like to do to pianos to get a cool sound out of them. So the very first thing, I've been compensating and editing by making that a lot louder, but really pianos, when you drag them in like this, are super quiet. I like to use some compression just to really bring them out, make them a little more powerful, like this. See, that's just a single band compressor that's super big, but in this software specifically, like in Contact, I have the option to adjust the tone of the piano. So I can make it super soft, we can get a sound like this. There was the default middle that we were already at, sounds like this. And of course we can go hard as well. This one I think sounds a lot like, you know, like 2012 house piano tracks like that. Super cool sound. Really cool, and you can also choose the lid position as well. Lots of cool options to make your pianos sound more interesting. Something else I really like doing, effect-wise, is throwing a disperser before a big compressor. Disperser is a very neat plugin for editing your sounds, because you get this really cool, like, pinchy tone. Like, for example... Let me crank it a bit so it's more obvious. You see what I'm talking about there? Very cool thing for sound design, not limited to just pianos either, which is really nice. You could truly accomplish a lot with Disperser. Very cool plugin. As well as this, if you're going for a more like old kind of eerie sound, try throwing a chorus on a piano. Listen to this. There's a lot of ways you could transform a piano that like maybe sounds too clean, like dirty it up a little bit, make it fit the kind of vibe you're going for like that. Very easy to go and do that. Another thing that I want to talk about is using, again, that PAX folder to get a nice guitar tone. Now, unlike piano, I think MIDI guitar is a lot harder to get right. But, you know, there are creative ways that you could go and use this. This one in particular, this jazz guitar, I think sounds really nice. Check this one out. And what's really nice as well, that effects chain we did before on the piano would work really nicely with this tone too. I think that sounds super cool. And it's very easy to set up again. That's just two plugins. Now, this folder also has electric pianos as well, and you'll notice, again, that effect chain, super good for these. Oh, 
Honestly, FL Studio has some premium sounds that are just completely built in. Very easy to get professional results. Another thing that I do want to touch on in this video is how to tame harsh frequencies. You'll often notice when you're making music, especially if it's something a little more aggressive, it's really easy to get frequencies in there that hurt your ears. Let me try to demonstrate this in a good way. So we're going to grab a instance of Serum, maybe throw on a saw stack, and get some square in there too, just so this is like super in your face. This sort of sound. That'll be a good example, because that's really loud, and it's very full spectrum. So if we look at this with an EQ here, and just play something up high, You know, this is a super bright thing. We could get rid of some of those highs, like I said before, that nice EQ tip, but there are going to be harsh resonant frequencies that still exist. Now, I'm going to be demonstrating a paid plugin here, but this is one of the ones I highly recommend you purchase if you're serious about production, because it has helped me more times than I can count. This is Soothe. So they're out with Soothe 2 now, but if you buy Soothe 2, you also get Soothe 1. And this is a dynamic resonance suppressor. This basically means in real time, this will tame harsh resonant frequencies. Let me demonstrate that. So we're going to just go ahead and draw in something in this pattern. Just that way, it's there. Now, Soothe, if we adjust like sharpness and depth, is going to remove what it deems as like harsh frequencies. So if we push it really hard, obviously you don't want to do that, but you know, bring it in slowly. And if we take it off, you want to keep A being until you could clearly hear the difference. So it's around there. If we listen to it, like what it's removing, it's just things that like at loud volumes are kind of piercing to the ears. You don't want to overdo it, but Soothe is great for this. It's especially great on things like vocals, because vocals can get like harsh S sounds, for example. This will take care of that and more. Sometimes you might also have something that has a super low resonant, like fundamental. This is great for scooping that out in real time as well, and it's completely dynamic, so it's not going to be taking it out in areas where it doesn't exist. Highly recommend Soothe too. Now I think the last thing we're going to talk about in this video for production tips, this is kind of a relatively new one because FL Studio only recently added this. This is AI mastering. Now mastering, I know especially when you're getting into music production, seems super complicated. I've done kind of my own way that is pretty straightforward and simple, but FL Studio now will do it for you, which is really cool. All you do is you go to the export menu, which is where you'd normally go to choose like what file format you want, but instead you hit master. Now a window will pop up and you could choose like what kind you want to do if you want to do any references or whatever. And you can mess with that. I do have an in-depth video talking all about that, but all you have to do from there is hit the start button and it's going to start rendering this for you with mastering. It will take a bit longer than a normal export because it has additional things to do. But overall, I've found that this genuinely sounds really good. I did show on my channel before the difference between like a pre-master and then what that would give you. And it's really nice, like you get a very clean result. And it's impressive because this is relatively new technology, I feel. But FL Studio really does a good job of that. You could get AI mastering for free as long as you're on the latest version. I believe that was introduced alongside 21.2, which is the current version of FL Studio as of the time I'm making this. Definitely give it a try. It is very underrated. I don't see many people talking about it anymore. Most of the buzz was a few months ago, but it is genuinely a super good feature. Highly recommend checking it out. But that does wrap up our 30 minutes of music production tips and tricks. I hope this video has helped you out. Hopefully you did learn a lot of things from it. I know this is a super long one, but I thought this would be a good idea. Just, you know, get a whole bunch of my tips in one place. Let me know in the comments below what helped you out and be sure to share your additional tips in the comments below. Because music production, there's so many things like that. There's going to be a lot to say, so I'm very curious to see what you guys have to suggest as well. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to drop a like on it, and subscribe to stay up to date with future music production tutorials from me. But again, that does wrap us up. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.